Machine learning in production, isn't it awesome? But what does this production even mean? Today I want to talk about buzzwords. Who doesn't like them? They make us sound smart. They allow us to convey a lot of information with a single or few amount of words. Uh, but they can also introduce inferential distance and they can be confusing. Now buzzwords aren't fundamentally bad, though the term does sometimes evoke a negative sentiment. They can be dangerous, however, giving us the feeling that we understand something uh, without actually being able to explain it in simple terms. And I want to talk in this talk about a specific buzzword that I took for granted, which is production. So to start with the story, um, I was giving a talk about applying machine learning in practice and covering MLOps, which we all love. Um, I shared the obvious notion with my audience that machine learning models are not just for research, maybe not even mostly for that. And then I asked the question um, that I thought was really simple. If you create a great model, but no one ever uses it, in other words, it's not deployed to production, does it really matter? Now, I thought this would be a great rhetorical question to start uh, my talk with. But one of the listeners uh, raised their hands and asked, when you say production, what exactly do you mean? And I found myself noticing the inferential distance. I was treating something vague that seemed clear to me, um, asking questions about it, taking it as a given, when in fact many data scientists might have a very different notion of what production is. And this is how this talk was born. So, hi, I'm Dean. Uh, thanks for joining my talk. My background is a combination of physics, uh, machine learning, and computer science. I am very passionate about building tools that help machine learning teams work together. Um, I'm a strong believer in open source and the role it has to play in the world of machine learning. And I am the co-founder of DAGSA, which is building a GitHub for machine learning. We take popular open source tools and combine them into a platform that makes them easier to use, um, adding the workflows that are needed for working on, on those uh, tools together. And I'm also the host of the MLOps podcast, where I speak with industry leaders and experts about getting uh, ML into the real world. A new episode just dropped today, so check it out. But back to my question, let me ask you again. If you create a great model, but no one uses it, does it really matter? Now, applying a first principles approach, let's define production in the context of machine learning models for a sec. So putting a machine learning model in production means that your machine learning model's uh, predictions or outputs directly affect some product or user, whether it's by educating them, helping them uh, make decisions, or enabling them to do something they couldn't do before, like creating images of a Van Gogh-looking Shakespearean character, which Stable Diffusion helped me do here. Now, to put this into a bit of context, there was this famous statistic about 87% of models never making it to production. It is wrong, probably. Um, but my reading of the sentence is that a large part of ML models never make it to the point where they actually have an impact um, on any product or user or consumer. And that's a shame. So today, what I want to do is make sure that you don't fall into this specific hole and you have uh, the right mental model and tool set to get to the desired land of production. Um, and now that we've defined what production is for machine learning models, we can ask another question, which is what types of production are there? When I asked the people of Reddit, I got a bunch of interesting answers. So for some, it's a deployed model endpoint. And in this case, the deployment might be done as a Lambda function or whatever. Um, you might build the model into an application that runs on an edge device. I spoke with a bunch of people that do that here. Um, but it might be something entirely different. For some, they run a model locally on a regular cadence, then upload the predictions as a table to a database, which is queried by their consumers. Some people shared that their production is actually a dashboard that they send out to management, where a machine learning model is creating some of the information in that dashboard. And last but not least, it might be that the model is just part of a larger ETL process and might just create a single feature. Uh, in other words, your model might be just another part of a pipeline. Um, and I think this last point is worth diving into. Because when we think about machine learning, we usually imagine something like this, sort of a machine learning model, which is a black box with potentially math magic happening inside uh, that receives some data and then spits out a cat dog prediction. But in my experience, most times this is a uh, grand oversimplification of reality, and reality looks more like this. So your model is a sort of de facto data transformation, transformation running as part of a larger pipeline that might include pre or post processing steps, as well as other models. Now, you might ask why does this small or arguably small difference matter? I think that first as a, a different mental model of what production looks like, 
uh, affects how we think about building production grade models. We need to understand the relationship between the models that we train and the da data that they're trained on, thinking about the entire system, right? Starting from the raw data all the way to the consumption of our models predictions. This will increase uh, your productivity by avoiding hacky solutions that are not actually fit for production. The second reason is that it helps you better understand your problems and challenges uh, and the requirements from the solutions that you're going to choose. You can't solve a problem if you don't really understand it. So I'm talking a lot about first principles uh, thinking. Uh, let's just define what exactly what that means. Uh, so what we're going to do for first principles thinking is basically discuss the basic assumptions we have about the problem, then break the problem down into the smallest irrefutable pieces and try to build up the solution from those uh, uh, pieces bottom up. So what, are, what am I assuming here? First, I'm assuming that we are deploying a single model, the simplest case for deployment. And this is so that you can easily understand the process well and extrapolate it to your use case for deployment or production later. Um, we're also going to take the simplest flow described earlier. So you can assume this like black box model contains multiple steps, but they're just all bundled into one package. And if by the end of this talk, you still feel like what I'm talking about does not apply to your use case, reach out to me. I would honestly love to help you. Um, and the last thing is I'm not going to discuss anything that relates to training that model. I'm assuming it's ready to go and you're now trying to figure out what to do with it. So how do we break deployment down into its constituent components uh, from first principles. Well, I'm going to go over sort of a theoretical breakdown and then uh, go over each step and give you some practical recommendations of how we think about it. So we have our model ready. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to need to write a bit of code, a function that wraps this train model, loads it, receives the data, and performs the prediction, and then returns that uh, prediction as a function output. And once we did that, we can now predict locally, which is pretty awesome. The first time you do it, it's exciting, right? Um, but we don't only want to predict locally or only in one language. So usually step two is to build an interface with the real world, an API. It can receive some standard format request, parse the information and send it to our function, and then return the prediction in another standard format uh, message. Now, now that we did that, we can communicate with the model in a universal language, and that's awesome, but it's still running locally. And we need to figure out a way for it to be run in other places. We need to have it not just work on my machine. Yes, this is a stable diffusion interpretation. Um, so in other words, the third step is to make sure our API is inside an environment that makes it portable and able to run wherever we need it to. This package contains the environment, code, API, and other requirements so that it just runs. And once we have that thing, we have a portable environment for our model. It can communicate with the world in a standardized uh, format, which causes our model to predict and then return that prediction. We're almost there. The last uh, and uh, the fourth and final step is to put this somewhere consumers can actually use it. In other words, we need some infrastructure to host our uh, container. Usually, this means the cloud, a magical place where anything could happen. But it doesn't have to be. Uh, infrastructure can be on-prem, too, or on an edge device in some cases. So now that we've done that, we can basically use our model from anywhere we want with a universal language. It triggers it. It returns its prediction. It's basically ready to be incorporated into our product. So to put everything into one slide, this is sort of the four-step breakdown of what deployment is, taking a first principles approach. At this point, you might be asking yourself, this is simple. What am I doing here? Um, but I think that this is awesome because it means that we no longer need to solve for production or deployment. There are no longer buzzwords. We have four much more tractable sub-problems that we need to solve. And once we solve all of these problems, we are effectively in the land of production. And now that we have that laid out, let me go over a few recommendations for each of these steps, uh, including recommended tools, which people like to take snapshots of. So for step one, recommended tools, the correct choice here is always the tools you're already familiar with, if possible. For most people, this means Python, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Scikit. Um, but you sometimes do have additional constraints, like the programming language that you have to use in the end, um, or support for GPUs. So it is important to take those into consideration. I also would encourage you to think about model portability. If that's something that you care about, you might want to look into portability first formats like ONNX. This is especially important if you deploy to multiple types of endpoints. Um, but as your company grows, you'll want to standardize the deployment process anyway. And a great way to achieve that is to use a non-framework specific format for your models. 
In a similar vein, it is also worth spending a bit of time defining a company or team-wide class or interface for your model's prediction function. This will help with interoperability and automation as you grow. It's really not that high effort and it has huge benefits. Step two. So here you can use uh, anything from manual implementation with Python requests all the way to fast API, which is my current favorite. They are all great tools and you can always Google tutorial machine learning API with X and find great uh, materials. I tried it, it works. Um, it is important to note that some model consumers require non-flexible endpoints. So some tools that we've worked with require your prediction endpoint to be at model URL slash predict and they won't accept anything else. So you need to make sure that you know your consumer's requirements and implement them the proper way to save yourself a lot of pain and uh, effort. And um, last for this part, you should also consider the context of your deployment. In a distributed microservice architecture where your model is exposed to the web, I know a lot of buzzwords, um, you'll need to implement authentication for it many times, control who gets access to the prediction and everything. Now, this is beyond the scope of this talk, but I'll provide some example reading material uh, in the last slide, uh, which I think is important because a lot of tutorials just gloss over this and assume you'll just figure it out. For step three, my answer is, of course, Docker. A lot has been said about it, uh, but it's a good idea to have some understanding of how it works and how to use it. And even if you use something else, it's probably using Docker under the hood. There are many amazing tools that offer automatic processes that cover API and containerization together, so steps two and three, and they are great. But the reason they can automate these steps is because they are making decisions on your behalf. So if you have a very standard deployment uh, use case, they can work. But for customization, you're usually going to need to dive a layer deeper and get into the nitty gritty of Docker. So it's not really a full replacement. And I still recommend you have the basic understanding of how that works. Last but not least, in our final stages, we don't exactly have recommended tools as much as our necessary deployment setup. So your constraints such as deploying a microservice endpoint, a Lambda function, a pipeline stage, or a user's edge device will dictate what you're going to use here. And of course, a talk like this cannot be complete if I don't talk about GPUs. Um, most of the infrastructure that exists um, in the world isn't targeted towards machine learning specifically. And one of the main differences is our increased demand for GPUs. So working with them is complicated and sometimes requires special care. And many of the tools that I mentioned in the previous step uh, also help you deal with GPUs in your deployment process. But you can also find great content about working with them directly or via dedicated cloud services like AWS SageMaker. So this is it, we've reached the end of our journey and I want to end with a few resources for you to take the next step with each process. We usually feel that it's very easy to take the first step but the second one is hard so you can read over these and they cover like it's one article for each step. Um, and that's it, thank you for joining my talk. I hope it was useful. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn or reach out to me uh, here outside the, the talk. I also have swag that I'm very happy to give you. So come talk to me. Um, yeah. Thank you.